extremely jet lagged at the moment. I'm supposed to be asleep. I have a flight this morning and my brain thinks it's the morning. It's currently nearly 5 a.m. I've given up trying to sleep at all because I have to be awake in an hour. So instead I thought I'd reflect on my trip the past two days very briefly and also go over you know, the obstacles that people might find traveling to Gulf countries and what prevents people or the what uh, issues people perceive prevent them from coming here. Now, uh, I've just spent an amazing two days in Kuwait City. I was warned before coming to Kuwait that it's there's nothing to do, there's nothing to see, it's lifeless. I've I got more warnings than I can list at the moment. But I've had an amazing two days. Now, partly this is because I, earlier this year, met an amazing, uh, amazing friend from Kuwait. I sat next to him on business class from Dubai to Istanbul. It's a complete coincidence because the lady next to me switched seats with him. So he wasn't even meant to sit next to me and we got talking and I'd already wanted to sort of come to Kuwait at the time and meeting him only reinforced sort of that dream further. Now, uh, last year, as many of you might know, I went to Bahrain for three days and this year I'm here I am in Kuwait for two days. So what are the biggest obstacles? Well, people think that you know, this area is scary, it's different, it's it's not like where you'd normally go on holiday and like to a certain extent that's true but also people don't realize actually how easy things are once several small obstacles are sorted out so I will go through those with you right now. So firstly, the Middle East, do people speak English? The answer is yes. There are so many overseas workers here that English is sort of the lingua franca that holds everyone together. You don't need to speak Arabic. I, I know like five words, if that, but I still found I had no problems and everyone was still really, really polite to me and really helpful. And uh, I, I didn't have any issues not speaking Arabic or any other languages from the region. Just speaking English was fine. Now, obviously that should be like a a modicum of respect so if you can say hello and thank you and a few basic phrases of course that helps especially in places like markets so finding in whether it is the UAE of course or Bahrain or Kuwait in the capital cities anyway everyone spoke English and it was really really easy okay secondly your biggest expense in the Gulf countries will be transport now public transport exists but it's quite I find difficult to use. I could have caught the bus, but because of the vast distances between a lot of the attractions, it's just often quicker and more efficient to catch a taxi. Also, crossing the road here can be lethal. There's like six lane highways and the speed limits, like everyone just goes crazy. And if there's a pedestrian crossing, no one's gonna stop for you anyway. It's actually often safer so sad, but crossing the road by car and on foot. So your biggest expense will be a driver uh, in the Gulf countries. Not, I'm not talking about the UAE because there's a metro system and there's really well established public transport. But if you're going somewhere like Bahrain or Kuwait City, you need a driver. And like how I sorted this out was in Bahrain, because geographically Bahrain was so small, it was quite easy to just have a driver. So my Airbnb host in Bahrain had his own driver and he recommended him to me when I came and I used that driver uh, to help me out, especially because I went scuba diving in Bahrain and so the scuba diving uh, center was quite out of town compared to where the central business district was. Luckily in Bahrain, there is a tour service, a tour bus. So that took me around to most of the main tourist attractions in Bahrain, which you can comfortably do in a day. Now in Kuwait, my friend here was very kind to first of all, lend me his driver. And secondly, uh, his sister, his wonderful sister took me, spent pretty much a whole day driving me around to the attractions. So, I mean, if had I not had that support, I would probably need 
to, to have hired a taxi to get from everywhere efficiently and quickly, especially for a two day trip. So if you keep in mind that those are going to be your challenges, uh, once if you know someone locally, uh, it's always helpful. Now I actually put up my trip to Kuwait uh, on couchsurfing.com and uh, the response was phenomenal. I had about 30, over 30 responses to meet up, have coffee, go to art galleries. Unfortunately, like, I apologize to all of those people now. Uh, I didn't have time in those two days, it turns out, because I didn't know at the time that my friend from that I met earlier would end up organizing everything for me. So you know, apps like Couchsurfing, other apps that allow travelers to meet locals. If you can know a local, you will have a much better experience uh, in places like this, especially ones where the tourism infrastructure is still developing. It's not somewhere people go away for the weekend. So we've got the language is not a barrier and you need a car somehow. And it's always helpful, more helpful to know someone. Had I not known anyone, I probably would have just wandered around and gotten a little bit lost and, and that was it. But because I did know someone and they were able to recommend the best places to visit, it made the experience so much better having locals with me to share that experience. So airport wise, I found that Bahrain was really easy. It was like I remember visa on arrival, really simple, really quick, and got straight out of the airport. Now, Kuwait's a little trickier, and it was my own fault. All the blogs said have three Kuwaiti dinner exactly, because the machine doesn't give change. And I was like, oh, I'll be fine, I, I won't get change. So I turn up, and really frustratingly, so I sat in the front row of business class, going from Dubai to Kuwait. I was like the second person off the plane, but because I did not have correct change, I had to then go to a cafe and buy a small piece of chocolate and get the right change for this machine. That put me at the back of the visa queue and it took about an hour. So what to do coming to Kuwait City? Get the right change. Three dinner at time of uh, posting. So get three one dinner notes. Don't take a five dinner note. You're not gonna get change from it. It is the highest value currency in the world. So you don't wanna be losing those extra dinners. So get the right change for your visa. And uh, then it's a little bit of a wait depending on how many immigration officers were there. I, it took about an hour for me. Had I had the correct change and stayed in line as the maybe second or third person off the plane, I probably would have only taken half an hour. So, I mean, that's my, on me because I did my research and now all of you know that if you're coming to Kuwait, get exact change. When you're changing your money, request one dinar notes. Don't just get 10 dinar notes it's, and split it later. It's a bit of a nightmare. Uh, airport wise, I would arrange an airport taxi for, uh, or I actually arrange an airport pickup from your hotel and um, all hotels can arrange this in Kuwait. Uh, I know in Bahrain I stayed in an Airbnb so I use the driver but hotels should be able to arrange an airport pickup. It's probably the most efficient way to do it because especially at Kuwait I found the airport was somewhat chaotic uh, with a lot of people coming and going and the area for taxis wasn't to me that clear either. There was a limousine waiting area and then there were a few signs for airport taxi, but it was just so much easier to have someone waiting uh, waiting at the airport with my name on the sign. So and that price, standard price is eight Kuwaiti dinner from for an airport transfer into the inner sea. So wrapping up, coming to Kuwait, uh, or to any of the Gulf states, don't stress about language. Organize a driver or meet locals that are able to show you local sites. Otherwise, it's hard to get around and have exact change for your visa. Uh, well, in Kuwait anyway, it, was, it, helped, it would have helped a lot to have the correct change and organize your airport pickup in advance. If you've already organized the driver, then you can include that as part of your airport pickup. I will do other posts on uh, the things I actually did in Kuwait City, I had an amazing time. Despite all the naysayers saying it's boring, there's nothing to do, I that couldn't be further from the truth. 
if you make an effort. If you sit in your hotel room and do nothing or you don't organize these things in advance because the tourism infrastructure is not there yet. There's no metro around town. So if you don't organize your transport in advance and you're not getting to these venues and these attractions and things to do, that's very hard to get around. And I can see why people would be bored if they were stuck in one end of the city and couldn't get to another. Also, this is an amazing time of the year to visit. It is currently November, 23 degrees, cloudy. It's beautiful, it's not hot at all. Fantastic time to visit. Anyway, I hope this helped a little bit in making up your mind and uh, coming over to uh, this area and having a visit because I think it's it can really open your eyes. The people are so kind, so hospitable. People at the market were so nice last night and uh, I will post a little bit more about my actual trip. But until then, I hope I can encourage more people to come and visit uh, what is a very, very fascinating a part of the world.